Hello. Um, I should point out that the, the mankini wearing, for, for those who weren't at Frontiers, that was over the top of, of normal clothes, right? So that, you know, if you are going to look at the images, you're not going to be uh, too horrified. Now, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago, I, wrote a, I posted an Alista Part article on, on this very subject. Um, and some people were so offended by the, just the title that they refused to read any further. And I figured, you know, in Amsterdam, I'm not going to have you know, any kind of problem here. But this is being live streamed over the internet, so I kind of grudgingly decided to, to tone it down and, and change the title. The title of the talk is now, uh, The Application Cache is a Douchebag. And if you think the rest of the world should accommodate your fetish for puritism, then you're a douchebag too. <laughs> and a selfish one at that. So back in the dial-up days, we were really at peace with the internet being this uh, sort of transient thing. You, you, you'd log in, you'd check your email, and then you'd get out. You, you, were only, you only had internet uh, connectivity for short periods of time. But now we're almost always online. We, when the, we did the poll yesterday. Very few people uh, didn't have an internet-connected device on them right now. But that makes being without a connection kind of a, a big deal. And anyone who's from abroad and having to roam for data will, will know what I mean. When I'm data roaming, I feel like a, a gambling addict. You know, I, every time I connect, I know I'm hemorrhaging money, but I just can't help myself. I need to know what the internet's saying about me behind my back or what, what's going on. My phone makes this little sound when I turn data roaming on as a kind of warning, but I don't really need it because I can kind of hear the champagne corks popping in the T-Mobile offices with every megabyte I eat. I'm disgusted by my own dependency on data. Um, in the office where I, where I used to work, uh, once upon a time, I needed to take a dump. And there were five cubicles to choose from. Unfortunately, the first four were occupied. And that's usually OK. One toilet is usually all I need. But I knew from previous experience that the office Wi-Fi only reached the first four. <laughs> And there's no mobile data in there either. And I, and I thought for a moment, and I decided, no, no. I find this totally unacceptable. And I turned around, and I went back to my desk, and I waited until later. I, as a person, I, I've become someone who actually requires an internet connectivity to take a dump. What can we do to fix this? Well, obviously, we can't create data out of nowhere, but we can make sites work uh, offline with, with pre-downloaded data, and we can let the users use that data in new and interesting ways. Historically, browsers only worked with an internet connection. They still had a cache. They've always had a cache, or pretty much always. But neither the user of the website or the developer of the website have enough control over that cache to create a reliable offline experience. Google weren't happy with this, and they created Local Server as part of the Gears API to try and solve that. And as you can see, that's, that's no longer available. Uh, the Google Gears project is no longer active, because most of the ideas were, were taken on by the WG. The offline stuff was reimagined as uh, offline web applications, and therein lies the application cache, the kind of anti-hero of this presentation. Now, the application cache is kind of like a candidate from The Apprentice. Now, I don't know if you guys get the UK version of The Apprentice, and if you don't, you're probably wondering why I've shown you this photo of a man who looks like a shaved hedgehog who's suffering from ingrowing spines. He's, he's Alan Sugar. He's, he's like the boss man of the whole thing. Uh, he's a bit of a douchebag, but I promise you he's way more likable than the US alternative, Donald Trump, whose hair alone looks like this kind of cloud of piss that's become lodged atop a ragged sex doll, or certainly in this photo. It, the, uh, the app cache is actually more like one of the candidates from the show. When they're interviewed, they're incredibly confident, and they're really good at selling themselves. They'll turn, turn to the camera and, and look it directly in the lens and say, I can turn your offline user experience from sucks ass to success. And it's just one file, and boshes, it works. But when they're actually given the task, they desperately try and get noticed. They trample over everything else, and um, they, they try and take over the operation. The job will get done in a manner of speaking, but you're left with this loud, horrible business douchebag at the center of it all. And you have to be very careful not to let this douchebaggery uh, leak through and uh, for the end user to suffer from it. And we're going to look at how you'll prevent that. How you use the applica application cache kind of depends on the kind of site you're building. There are two extremes that I'm going to look at, sites that tend towards discovering content and sites that toward, uh, tend towards using content. So in terms of getting stuff, I'm talking about sites like uh, Wikipedia, travel sites, YouTube, Twitter, things like that. These are sites with loads and loads of content. And as a user, you find that content, and you look at it. And there's not a lot else you, you do with it. The heavy lifting tends to be done on the server. They tend to have lots of URLs that are hopefully meaningful. Alternatively, do stuff sites, things like Google Docs, linters, validators, games, 
uh, online IDEs. They offer a, quite a small amount of content themselves, relatively speaking, but you can do a lot with that content, or you can create your own content using it. The heavy lifting here tends to be done on the client, or, or could be done on the client. They tend to have fewer URLs. This is the main case that application cache was, was designed for. However, the application cache spec is kind of like an onion. Peeling through it can reduce a grown developer to tears. So how would you go about offlining one of these do stuff sites? Now, I realize that I've taken the word offline and verbified it. In fact, I just took the word verb and verbified that as well. And I'm afraid there isn't really a good uh, verb for making stuff work offline. Um, besides, I'm told it's best to explain things using your own words, and these ones aren't even the dictionary, so double points to me, I think. So with that in mind, let's look at offlinerizing spritecow.com. <laughs> so here's a quick demo. This is, this is like the only useful thing I ever made. The idea is you load an image, your CSS sprites, get it like that, you click on a part of it, and you get the CSS for that bit. All the server does here is just serve the pages. It's, all, it's a single page app, JavaScript driven, all happens on the client. And if I were to cut the connection to the site and refresh the page, we get nothing. And that's a shame, because it would be nice to be able to use something like SpriteCow uh, on the train or the plane when we have no internet connection. So let's fix that. To make the site work offline, we take our HTML element and we point it at a manifest. Now, fortunately, the manifest file isn't XML. We've managed to get over that whole thing. Unfortunately, it's a custom-made format just for application cache. It starts with cache manifest in capital letters, which is not a great start because the caps lock is the sword of the douchebag. But after that, just list all the files that form part of your app, your CSS, your JavaScript, any of the assets that are used by those things, images, fonts, etc. All of these URLs are relative to the manifest file itself, but you can include absolute paths to, to other domains. The only rule is you can't cross the schemes. If your page is HTTP, uh, you can only link to HTTP, uh, HTTPS, you need to link to HTTPS. You'll notice that the HTML file uh, isn't listed here, and that's because pages pointing to a manifest um, implicitly become part of that cache. They're automatically part of the cache. Oh, and make sure you serve this file with this MIME type, uh, text slash cache manifest. This is going to be dropped from the specification. Uh, there's kind of talk about that. But many of the implementations out there already, they require it. So make sure you do that. And with that one very, very simple change, I can now take the, uh, the connection down and refresh the page. And voila, it's, it's, it, it works. It's all just, just happened. And that can seem like it's, it was very, very easy. And the browser support for it's actually quite good. The desktop browsers, have, they've supported it for quite a while. Um, in terms of mobile support, we've got iOS, uh, Android, BlackBerry. They've supported it for quite a while as well. Unfortunately, there's no support in Internet Explorer, and therefore no support in Windows Mobile either, although it is supported in the latest previews of IE10. So we can kind of assume it's going to be there when they fully launch IE10, and hopefully it will make it onto the phone as well. All of these browsers let you use App Cache transparently with the exception of Firefox, which will bring up like a little menu like this, and the, the user has to grant it permission for it to work. And that's the same on uh, Firefox Mobile as well. It can seem at first like this application cache thing is a, a very small piece of progressive enhancement. But watch this. If I go into an editor, and I'm going to take the title here, uh, I'm going to change it to High Mobilism. Did I spell that right? Mobilism. And save that. And if I'm going to refresh the page now, keep refreshing, no change. The behavior of the site has significantly changed from, from what we'd expect. And this is the first piece of, of evidence of douchebaggery we're going to look at. The, the application cache completely takes over. Let's try and sum up what's happening here. When you first look at a page, it's requested normally. And if that's an HTML page and that's pointing to an application manifest, the manifest is downloaded. And then all the files listed in the manifest are downloaded. And if they all download fine, it forms part of the cache. If any file 404s or 500s there, uh, the whole caching process fails. It, the cache won't settle. It won't be saved. I've seen this described as a, a kind of gotcha. But it's not really. This is, this is what makes it good. This is what makes it better than the normal browser cache. With this, we can rely on the cache being all there, fully populated, all the files are there, all not there at all. And, and that's what we don't get with the normal browser cache. Subsequent requests may go differently. If you make a request to something uh, which is app cached, it will come from the cache. Otherwise, it's requested normally. A lot of blog posts and speakers on the subject, they, they make the assumption that the cached version is only used if you're offline, and that's not true at all. If there is a cached version, it will always be used. 
um, it, it just it takes over immediately. On the plus side, it means the browser doesn't have to waste time trying to decide if you're online or offline. Because offline could mean uh, you don't have a cable plugged into your laptop, or you don't have a, a, a connection uh, to the mobile provider, or um, there's a DNS problem along the way, there's a proxy problem, the internet connection is just too slow to really make a, a, a proper connection. And, and making that decision is really, really slow. So app cache speeds things up by, by just always using the cache version if it's there. But although the page comes from the cache, it will also check the manifest in the background and look for updates. But if it's checking for updates, why are we not getting this, this change of title? Why, why are we not getting what we expect? Unfortunately, this is another piece of douchebaggery. The application cache has its own system of cache validation. You see, the application cache won't update files unless the manifest has changed in some kind of way, just a, a byte different change. And yeah, any, any kind of change. So this is the, the manifest we were looking at before. And you'll see a lot of the assets have version numbers in them because they're far future cached. You can see it there, V1. And updating those involves changing the URL to V2. And that, because that's a change in the manifest, everything just kind of works as we expect. But unfortunately, we're changing the HTML file, not the CSS, not the JavaScript. And that's not listed here. And even if it was listed here, we can't change the file name of it because that's going to change the URL to the page. Common practice to get around this is to add a, a comment into the manifest file itself. Comments start with a, a hash symbol or a pound symbol in the manifest file. And even though it's a comment, that counts as a, as a change to the manifest file. Here I've just done something like uh, v2, but you could do some kind of clever build system that has some kind of equivalent, equivalent thing of e tags or something, some more automated system. This is the biggest ball ache when trying to develop application cache sites, having to remember to change this file every time you change another file you're working on. And you can't do something like just generate a random number either, because when an application cache updates, it downloads the manifest, updates the, the files it needs to update, and then it downloads the manifest again. And if the manifest has changed during the update, the cache will fail. And the reason for this is it might have got the first two files from the old version, and then the next three files from the new version. So it's, it's kind of good that it does that assumption, but it means we can't just use a random number. The application cache is a byte for byte check. This is a additional to normal caching, or at least it is in, in some user agents. It is on Chrome, especially. It's not a replacement for normal browser caching, and it shouldn't be used as, it's not just a drop in performance uh, enhancement thing, because uh, it overcomplicates so much else. This may seem obvious, but this is what really catches people out when they're just playing around with application cache. They'll update a file, they'll update the manifest, and still don't see a change. And this is because they haven't set up proper caching headers. HTTP gives us quite a lot of options when it comes to you know, giving hints towards how something, uh, a file should be uh, cached. We can think, say things like no cache, you know, don't cache this, or make sure you're getting a fresh version from the server, must revalidate, you can give it a, a date when the file was last modified. Or you can say, hey, this, this file is going to be OK for a year or, or whatever, far future caching. Without any of these, the, um, the app cache goes to the networking layer, hey, could you update this file? And the networking layer goes, uh, but this doesn't have any caching instructions. How shall I go about updating it? Oh, yeah, however the fuck I want. And it's, it's, it's heuristics. And heuristics just mean toss a coin and do the wrong thing, right? And that's what we see here. Sometimes it will just decide, hey, do you know what? The version you've probably got is OK, and it will pass it back. The application cache will unwittingly update itself with a stale version from the application cache, and it won't tell you it did that. This kind of copying is, is really useful when you're in control of it, because you can save lots of HTTP requests. But out of control copying is, is bad. Out of control copying took Street Fighter and gave us Street Fighter the movie, and then gave us Street Fighter the movie the game. This, this was a thing that actually happened. I, I couldn't believe it when this game came out. I assume at this point someone had to jump in and reset Hollywood and reset the games industry before they just got themselves in this complete loop and everything exploded. In terms of your manifest, your things like JavaScript, CSS, you want to be far future caching those things, because you can change the URL easily uh, when you have an update. For content that changes but can't change the URL, like you know, your about pages or your index page, uh, make sure you serve like, no cache or must revalidate headers, and then uh, change a comment in the manifest file, and it will it'll update properly. Now, following that advice, you might think that you could do the same with the manifest file itself. You could have something like uh, application cache v1. And then when you want to make a change to it, you can put your far, far future cache that file. And when you need to make a change, change its file name to, to v2. And that will work like uh, JavaScript and CSS. You must never, ever do this. The application cache will really punish you for doing this. The problem here is, where does the browser find out about the new manifest? Well, from the updated HTML file. But where does it find out about the updated HTML file 
well, from the manifest, you've created this kind of circular dependency that will never be satisfied. And I did this with Sprite Cow, stupidly, I, I, and I deployed that change. And it was about 30 minutes until I realized what I'd done. And I hit, nipped in and uh, reverted the change. According to Google Analytics, 20 people had visited Sprite Cow in, in that time. Those 20 users will never get an update to the site ever again. <laughs> uh, they now live the life of, like, Drupal developers, everyone else is doing cool new things and they're stuck with the same old tired shit, you know? <laughs> so before we move on, uh, why do we have to why is, why do we have this why do we have to change a manifest file like this? Why do we have to jump through this extra hoop? Well it's a stupid reason, but but here it is. Imagine we had a manifest file like this, twenty or fifty URLs and they, they can't change. They can't change file name. Lots of pages. Updating this manifest is fifty HTTP requests, but it's fifty two if you include the, the manifest at either end. That's way too much overhead to be doing on every page. So the text changing trick is really just making it your problem. You know, the, the, the browser says, well, we can't do that every time, so it's now your responsibility to update this file when you want that to happen. That's just sweeping the problem under the carpet, in my opinion, but that's what we've got. But let's prove a point. Let's get that heading changed. I'm going to go into the app cache file and add a comment at the top, v2, let's say. And if I refresh the page, no change. Refresh again, and hooray, we've got our heading. Now, we saw something important there. It took two refreshes to see the change, and this is another piece of, of douchebaggery. Unfortunately, and this is by design as well, because we can see here if the URL is cached, it will come from the cache, and then it's updated. It's updated afterwards, and that's what we saw there. The first time we loaded the page, we got the old version, but it updated in the background, and then we refreshed the page and got the new version. There's a JavaScript event that you can use at this point to try and uh, deal with that, and it's called update ready. And that fires when there's, uh, there's been a change to the manifest, and it successfully downloads everything inside and forms a cache out of them. At this point, you could call swap cache. And what that does is that starts using the new cache immediately. But that's for subsequent downloads. But at this point, the horse is already bolted. You know, your page, is, your user's already downloaded the whole page and probably all of the assets on it as well. Swap cache is actually pretty useless. Uh, I don't know why it made it into the spec compared to some uh, glaring omissions. You could just trigger a reload of the page, and there are some articles that recommend this. But you know, imagine that Gmail did that to you. You know, the, the user may have started interacting with the page. You start writing an email, the page refreshes on you. That's a, that's a horrible user experience. An alternative is just within your app, show some kind of message indicating there's, a, there's a, an update. And you've probably seen Google Apps do this. Just invite the user to refresh the page at their convenience. Or another alternative is to just not care, and that's what I did with SpriteCow. I mean, okay, people might be using an old version for one view, but eh, it wasn't a problem for me. So, are we done yet? I mean, have we jumped through enough hoops to get this to work? Well, it looks like we have, but there's a little error has cre crept in, and you'd only see it if you're looking at Firebug or server logs, or not, not server logs, but in, uh, debugging tools such as Firebug or Web Inspector. The page analytics have stopped loading. So what's going on here? Well, here's a, a more visual example of what's going on. So here's some cats. This page uses a manifest. Here's the manifest. So you see the manifest links to a CSS file and obviously the HTML page. The images are not listed. Now, we are connected. Uh, the connection is active. And I'm going to refresh the page, and the images fail, even though we're connected. This is another piece of douchebaggery. The, the app cache doesn't like stuff that isn't part of the app cache. To explain what happened here, we have to go back to the diagram, unfortunately, because I spent a lot of time on the diagram, so I use it a lot. Unfortunately, we've missed some detail from the very start. When a GET request is made, the, the browser looks to see if this page is associated with a manifest. And if it is, then it uses that manifest and continues on, as we've already seen. If there isn't a manifest, then the request happens normally, as we're used to without application cache. Now, that sounds like a complicated way of saying what we've already said, but here's the difference. When a, a request is made from a cached page, like a CSS, JavaScript, images in the example, they go back through the system, but they don't reselect a manifest. They just use the manifest of the host page. So if you've got a cached page, you, 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 um, if, the pa if the image is cached, that's fine. It'll just work. But if the image isn't cached, the request will fail. It's no coincidence that this part of the specification is in section 666. It's, it's the specification of the beast. And that's what's happening here. That's why we're not getting these images loading, because they're, it, it's coming from the cache, and those images aren't in there. We can fix it by using the network section of the app cache file. And here we can list individual files, and they suddenly start working again. Or we can just put a single star, and that lets uh, anything through. 
the way this is working is uh, if the URL isn't cached, but it is specifically listed in, listed in network, then it will just be requested normally. Otherwise, if there's a star in network, the file will be requested normally. Otherwise, it fails. So you need to make sure that, uh, I mean, those images won't work offline. They'll only work online. But you need to make sure that your online-only assets, such as your uh, analytics, that they're catered for in the network section using, using one of those rules. Well, that's it. We've actually covered the uh, simple example now. And it's quite a, a horrific diagram. And this was at the point where I just wanted to shut myself in uh, the bathroom until the internet had gone away, maybe even in the end cubicle where there is no, the internet can't get me at all. But this is mobilism, right? We're, gonna, we're not afraid of peeling the app cache onion a little bit further. We're going to look at uh, reference sites, get stuff sites, content-rich sites. And I'm going to use m.lanyard.com as an example, because we used application cache to make uh, Lanyard work offline. Using the, the, the m. It's kind of our equivalent of our iOS app. And we wanted to kind of sandbox it, because we're going to play around with the application cache, which is why it's not part of the, the main site. You can use it to look up future conferences, uh, the events that you're tracking and attending, and those are the ones that will be offline. Um, and it's got like, the schedule and stuff in, whatever. That's the advertising bit done. Having this work offline, yeah, we thought that would be great, because when you're on a plane or traveling or in another country, you get that, that information. But there is too much data to offline efficate everything. But users are only interested in a subset of the data Lanyard has. Uh, Mark Pilgrim in Dive into HTML5, he had a, there was a decent section uh, on application cache in, in, in his sort of book. And he offered up a solution to offlineize Wikipedia. I thought, oh, well, that could work for us. And it worked by, on every page, linking every page to a manifest, every page on Wikipedia. The manifest file itself would just link to the, would just point at the JavaScript, the CSS, and, and imagery. But because pages pointing at a manifest implicitly become part of the cache, as you get lost in the uh, Wikipedia labyrinth, more and more of the site is becoming available to you offline. And it's dead simple, really simple as a solution, but it's also completely terrible. You, you, you should never, ever do this. And the reason is, well, there's no indication of which pages are available offline. There's no good user experience. The user can't rely on what will be there when they don't have a connection. And that's one of the things that's missing from the App Cache API. Those cache pages are, are going to be really difficult to update. The, all those pages that you cache offline are only going to update when we change a comment in the manifest file. And when do we change that? Every time a page on Wikipedia changes? I mean, that's, that's going to be far too frequent. And when those updates happen, they're going to be heavy. Um, say you look at 100 pages on Wikipedia, which we probably all have, maybe way more than that. So updating your offline cache is going to be 100 HTTP requests with you know, quite a lot of HTML in some cases, or thousands. And that number's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because there's no cleanup mechanism. We've got no mechanism to expire certain pages from that cache. The cache will eventually hit its allowed limit, and the browser will explode. And uh, yeah, it will fall out the floppy drive, which we all still have, right? There's nothing we can do about it. Ideally, we want to show, only show up-to-date content to the user. If the user's online, give them the online data. And then uh, let, we, we can control which content is cached, and we can defer that content to that control to the user like in the save offline or read later buttons. And we can indicate which of that content is available to them so they can rely on, well, when I'm on a plane, this is the stuff I'm going to be able to see. And we want to set that up from a single view on any page of the site. And unfortunately, the application cache makes this really difficult, because any page that's pointing to a manifest implicitly becomes part of the cache. When I was a kid, um, we had a, a sandbox in, in the garden. And it was, it was great, because you know, I'd go there to play and, and build stuff. It was a really good creative outlet for me. However, the family cats, they also used the sandbox for a completely different kind of outlet. Turns out you can't make sand castles out of cat shit. But I made some fantastic cat shit castles. But fast forward 20 years later, and here I am again. Someone's crapping in my sandbox, but this time it's the application cache. Putting a manifest attribute on an HTML uh, element means it will, the application cache is going to take over and start applying all of its own rules. To solve this, we should take the business douchebag application cache and pop him in a box where he can be Schrodinger's douchebag until we care whether he's dead or alive. And the way we do this is by only using the manifest on one page. We'll say offline stuff.html. And we make sure the browser knows about it from any other page by including it as a hidden iframe just at the bottom of the page. So there's only one page that's going to enter the cache, but from any page, it will set up the, the, the whole cache system. The manifest itself is going, to be, is going to have all of the usual stuff that we've seen, the CSS, JavaScript, uh, networking stuff, but also a new rule, fallback. The fallback rule has two parts to it, a URL prefix and then the full path to a file to make available offline. 
And this is where I really wish they used something like JSON, like Google Gears did, because this format's getting uh, quite complicated. So what does this do? Well, back to the diagram, of course. So if a URL isn't specifically listed in the network section, but it matches one of the prefixes in the fallback section, it will always try and match against the largest one as well. If there's a match, the request will happen normally. And if that request succeeds, then it's used just as, you, as it normally would, as if application cache wasn't there at all. If the request fails, then it uses the, the other URL that you gave it, and that will come from the cache, and it gives us this kind of nice fallback system. So a quick example of that is, uh, so here we go, this is a page, and that's being fetched online. If I remove the connection and refresh, we get a completely different page, but the URL doesn't change. It's like a, a, a redirect. So it's, it's not like a redirect, it's like a rewrite rather than a redirect. And that's gonna, be, that's gonna come in really useful. Unfortunately, by using fallback, we get into a little bit of browser trouble. Um, by using fallback, we wave goodbye to Opera support for the moment. They, they have it in a bug tracker, and I've heard that there's a developer working on it right now, which is great, because uh, unfortunately, we have code like this on, on lanyards at the moment, because there's, there's no sensible way to feature detect the, the fallback support. So we've got some browser sniffing. I'm really looking forward to removing that code. So we're using this manifest for just static data, the, the JavaScript and, and the CSS. What are we going to do for the user-specific data, the, things that the, the events that the user wants to be uh, saved offline? We're going to put that in local storage. And I've, I've thrown together a, a quick demo to show how this works. So from this page, you can see that I have two test articles. One of my test articles is bigger than the other test article. But that's not a problem. But you can see it's got this button here for save for offline use. And I'm going to click that. So what happened there? Um, when you click that button, this code runs. It looks at the uh, URL of the page, the path name, and it, uh, it, it saves that into the local storage against the, the URL name. And then it updates a, a, another index as well. And that means that if I take the page offline and refresh the page, uh, it works. But under the hood, it's actually going to a completely different page. Uh, oh, yes, my code examples don't load when I don't have a connection. That's a good point. Let's try that again. Excellent. Yeah, and so when you go to this other fallback page, it looks at the URL and sees if it's got content for that in local storage. And if it does, it displays it. Brilliant. Uh, you probably, this is a simplification of the code. You want to make sure that it, maybe you don't have data in, uh, in, in the local storage. You'll need to put a try catch around that in case you, you hit some kind of limits. But that's basically how m.lanyard works. The things that we, uh, and we can also show the user, because we've got this index, which, avail which data is going to be available offline. M.lanyard.com does things slightly different. We use JSON rather than HTML. We use Mustache to render that. So we've got, we're using the same templates on the server as we do on the client. And uh, the, the server remembers what the user has cached. So if they change their phone or whatever, oh, this is really falling off. Uh, if they change phone or, or the cache, uh, they lose the cache just because of some kind of phone error, we can repopulate that really quickly. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip through some of this. Unfortunately, we have a small problem with uh, some other requests start failing. I'm really sorry, we're going to have to go back to the unhappy place. Earlier, we found out that if a request is triggered by a page uh, that uses a cache, it will come from the cache. However, if a page didn't come from the cache, then no requests will be able to come from the cache either. So this means that if a user looks at your site on their phone and they're online, and then they drive in, the, well, not drive because they're not using their phone, but if they're on a train and they go into a tunnel, and uh, their, their app will start failing, it will fail to make connections, even if you've got that data in the cache. Another drawback to this method as well is it's poor error feedback. So you, you see I put a little bit of, of small print there. When a, how does it decide if a request went OK or not? Well, a request is OK if the HTTP response doesn't start with uh, 4004 whatever, or 5 something something, or if it redirects to uh, another domain. And that can sound a bit odd. Mm. You all get to hear me drink there. Excellent. But it caters for this, these kind of free uh, Wi-Fi things. So you know, it's going to redirect you to another domain. It catches that and treats that as offline. But that, um, unfortunately, it means we can't redirect to things like Twitter and Facebook for logins, which is a, a shame. And that makes our error messages a, a little bit vague. We just know, oh, something went wrong. We don't know what. Uh, well, that's, that's it, really. It started what turned out, what started as a very uh, simple flowchart um, and turned into this big, horrible Christmas tree of a thing. Uh, where I imagine the presents will be more like the presents my cats left me uh, in the sandbox than actual nice presents. So the point I've tried to make in the last uh, 29 minutes and 9 seconds, PPK's waving at me, is the application cache is a douchebag. As part of my therapy, I created a set of post-it notes on my wall uh, called Browsers are Dicks. And the idea is that whenever um, a browser messes up my day, 
I can just draw a little cock on it against that particular browser. <laughs> but I'm really struggling with this. Uh, but I had to create one for application cache, and it became very quickly riddled <laughs> with cocks. I don't know. But it's very, very useful. We need to learn how to, to work with it. We can sandbox in. We can make it work with data-rich sites. Uh, I am completely out of time. Uh, you can email me. Tests and stuff are there. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>